this weather. Ah, it's supposed to be at B&H, and you know, we gotta do this video. You know, I really hope it clears up. Um, it would be nice. Oh, look at that. Great, I think I might make it on time to do this video for B&H about virtual production. It'd be cool, you know, to really show them all the stuff we could do with virtual production. Oh wait, is this virtual production? Oh, it is. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Giralt from The Garage, and we're gonna to talk to you all about virtual production in the next few episodes here for B&H. So in today's episode, we're gonna cover the history of virtual production, all the hardware and software you would need to do a virtual production shoot, and also some of the details as far as lighting and content and things that you would put up on the LED wall or on your TV to be able to do in-camera virtual production. So virtual production is actually not new. I know a lot of people have heard of it just only since The Mandalorian came out and it was a big deal that they used an LED wall to do virtual production, but honestly, it's been around for decades. This is just a version of what is rear projection done a new way. Back in the day, they would project actually a background onto a screen, and that would be like while someone is driving a car, it would be behind them being projected. The new version of virtual production became the use of Unreal Engine or other real-time renderers so that people even shooting green screen or blue screen could see through an iPad or through a virtual camera, the person not just in the green screen, but actually in this environment that they're gonna create. Think about you know movies like Avatar or Titanic, where there's like really a lot of VFX that are happening. It allows the director to kind of see what is happening in the post side of things, but while they're actually shooting the content itself. So why use virtual production? Well, the real advantage to it is that it lets me, as the actor, be in the scene that I'm gonna be portrayed in. I could be shot on blue screen and composited in, but also things like the reflection of this water bottle right here, as you see, is very dynamic because it's actually reflecting the LED wall behind me. And it lets us also choose to be in different locations. Like to shut down an airport <laughs> like we're in right now to do a shoot would be really cost prohibitive, really challenging. And, you know, honestly, in this airport scene, we could actually even go outside on the tarmac, you know, move around this airport with total freedom in a matter of seconds or minutes versus having to actually move the lighting and the crew and everything around. So it really gives us a lot of flexibility about shooting multiple locations. For example, right now I'm in this airport, but I could also be in an office just like that with a click of a button. Obviously we could adjust the lighting to match this office a little better, but just gives you a sense of what we're capable of doing with virtual production. As we all know, flying a whole crew around the world, getting permits, getting the street closed off could be really cost prohibitive. Virtual production really allows filmmakers a whole new level of production value without the need of having all that happened by traditional standards. Our LED wall here today is about 24 feet wide and 10 feet tall. The difference between just an LED wall and a volume is actually the volume encompasses us in panels, right? It's gonna actually wrap around us where this is actually just a flat wall. So other possibilities that virtual production allows is we could change the weather, we could change the time of day, we could you know, make the world catch fire behind me, we could, you know, you name it, Anything you could basically create in the 3D environment, I can now live and be enveloped in that light and have everything that I'm, you know, in this scene reflect the light that is actually in that scene. For those of you that know the work that I do, I love to bend physics and time and slow motion and robots and do all this crazy stuff. So to me, virtual production is really exciting in that I don't just have to do a regular scene like this, but now I could do shots that otherwise just weren't possible in camera without a lot of really complicated work. So let's talk about what the bulk of our discussion is gonna be about, which is called IC VFX or in-camera VFX LED volume virtual production. <laughs> this is something that we're actually capturing in camera and we're using the LED wall to basically provide the world that we're in. 
So our LED wall is pretty big in reality, but you could also do this at a smaller scale. We've seen people use regular TVs. You know, if you have a 65 inch TV that, you know, is nice OLED and nice and sharp, you could basically put a product such as this in front of that TV, run Unreal, that's your monitor, and basically use the camera to basically shoot that product in front of that TV. You'll still need something as we get into all the hardware, you'll need some sort of tracking system if you actually want to be rendering the background as the camera moves, but we'll get to that in a second. So let's talk about the hardware, the stuff, the guts that drives this virtual production setup right here. So this is a row LED wall. It has a two point something pixel pitch. I don't, we're not gonna get into the details of those kinds of things, but that's basically the spacing between the LEDs on the wall itself. Obviously the bigger that number, the more spaced out the LEDs are, the smaller the number is, the smaller they get. You know, it really comes down to how tight you want the detail of that wall. Think about your 1080p TV versus your 4K TV. It's that same idea. All the LED panels that you buy usually need a processor. So here we have a Brompton processor, but basically they're gonna take your HDMI in or your SDI cable in, and they're the ones that actually break that signal out to all the individual panels. This wall behind me is actually made up of about 70 different panels that are all just kind of linked together and locked together. So you could kind of expand a wall or contract a wall based on what you're trying to do. The processor also is where you could control the color, the white balance, the contrast, how bright everything is, or if you want it more dim. Then obviously you need something that creates your video signal. Here we have a computer that we custom built here. It could be any computer, honestly, that could feed the wall some sort of a video signal. When you're running Unreal Engine, you're gonna need a really strong GPU powered computer, but it really comes down to how much resolution and how much frame rate you're trying to do, which is how fast you're trying to create the frames on the wall. You know, right now we're shooting at 24 frames a second, but you might wanna shoot at 60 or 120 or 240 frames a second and do slow motion, which is a whole new challenge but we're not gonna dive into that quite yet. If you're just gonna put up a 2D photo, let's say any photo you have or any video you've shot on the wall, then you just move your camera around that. It's the same as almost making a big printout of your background and you kind of move around and that's the, the background you have to play with. But if you wanted to do what we're doing here, which is actually using a 3D environment, then you need what's called a tracking system our robot, it actually feeds its data directly to Unreal Engine and it knows where it is in the 3D space. So as the robot moves the camera, it actually moves the camera in Unreal. At this level of virtual production, this kind of setup, you definitely need what's called a master clock. You basically need something to keep everybody on the same timeline. The shutter of the camera, right, is doing this, exposing, opening, closing, opening, closing. Well, the, the image on the wall behind me is also refreshing frame by frame with that camera shutter. So the camera shutter, the LED wall, and also your Unreal computer all need to be in sync with each other so that when the shutter opens, the LED wall is displaying that frame and Unreal is pushing that frame through the computer, through the processor, to the wall, all at the exact same time. If there's any delay in any of those, you'll feel some jitter or judder, you know, as the camera moves around. So it's really important to have something as simple as a master clock to keep everybody in sync. So we covered the wall, the processor, the computer, the tracking system. The other thing you'll obviously need is a camera, a lens, and some lights. Here, we're using a Rad Raptor XLX. It has these amazing tools like Global Shutter and also uh, this technology called Phantom Track that we'll get into at a later episode that lets us do some really crazy stuff with in-camera VFX virtual production. Now that we covered all the major hardware involved, you still need to put something on the wall behind me, right? But you could put any still up on the wall. You could do a stock photo, a photo that you've shot. I mean, it really comes down to how much parallax you want as the camera is gonna move. If you're gonna just do this where we are just locked off right now, then you don't have to worry about it. Put up a 2D photo and you can just use that. You know, the really cool thing about using 3D is the fact that we could move around this part of the airport. We could change our height and we could change where we are. We could change the lighting, the time of day, the color, what the people behind me are doing. We could change when the airplanes are taking off or landing. You know, we really have full control in 3D, but to get started, just 2D goes a long way. Another option to consider is what's called two and a half D. Basically, it's using a 2D image, a still, and basically segmenting it. So basically imagine there's 
a landscape, you have a foreground, then you have a midground, and then you have a background. So basically you could, what you could do is you could pull the foreground and the midground and have them just drift ever so slightly with your tracking data. So it gives you the sense of parallax without actually being a 3D asset. We have some content on the wall, we have a camera, we have a clock, we have all these things, LED walls. It's only as good as how you use this awesome new tool, right? So that's where lighting becomes really important. That's where also understanding how to make something cinematic becomes really important. And that just comes with practice. So as far as the lighting goes here, we'll have an episode just dedicated to what's called image-based lighting. What that means is actually you could use LED lights or other LED panels in that case, and you could actually map those lights to different parts of the scene around me, and they will match the lighting in that scene for you automatically. And we'll get into all those details in a future episode. So as you see in the frame, there is a small box, and then there's a big outer box on the LED wall behind me, and that's called the frustum. I know, it's a really hard word to say, frustum. But basically what that is, is the inner box is actually mapped to the lens itself so it's only rendering in high quality what the lens sees on the wall. You also see as the camera moves around, the fact that it changes shape. The software itself actually changing the shape of the image on the wall so that it makes up for the perspective of where the camera is in relation to the wall. Unreal Engine has what's called end display built into it. This is basically how it maps the projection of the image onto the LED wall. You could use what we're using here, which is assimilates live effects, which is also doing our Im image-based lighting as well, to do the projection onto the wall and the frustum so that it matches with the tracking data and it skews the world so that it doesn't look like we're looking at it at some funky angle. And the only reason why we're not rendering the whole wall to that angle is the fact that, that it really is taxing on the GPU of the computer. So the more pixels that we're rendering, the harder it has to work. The fact that we only render exactly what the lens sees is great because that's all we need to worry about, honestly, at the end of the day. We usually kind of portray some sort of sim single image from the scene that we're gonna be in for the outer frustum, just to have something to help that wrapped reflection. Whew, I know this is a lot. We've covered a lot of information here and I'm throwing a lot of words at you. We'll make sure to give you some notes in there to kind of help you understand all of these details. There's also a bunch of great groups online that you could go explore where people are sharing knowledge on virtual production like we are. The only reason to use any of this is to tell a story, to shoot a product, to tell a brand story, a uh, documentary, whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, it's a really fun new way of working where you have the control of the studio without the mayhem of being outside running around and having you know the light changing and you know trucks driving by and all the things that might happen in New York City, where we are at least. So for the next few weeks, you'll see a few more episodes coming out. The next one will cover a demo where we're actually gonna shoot a scene within this lovely airport we've created for you here and kind of break down the lighting techniques, the camera techniques in a little more detail. Then from the demo, we will break down for you the, the lighting scenario uh, dive a little deeper into image-based lighting, how you could use even other TVs and other things you might have around the house for image-based lighting, um, and dive a little bit into the Assimilate's live effects on how it could be used multiple ways as a controller for your image-based lights and also your projection of the image onto your TV or LED wall. And for the final episode, we're gonna go into post-production. I'll walk you through a little edit and we'll tie some shots together that we did here as part of the demo and really show you how this all comes together. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you subscribe and make sure you look out for the next episodes coming. It's gonna be really fun joining BNH and talking about all the things that go into shooting virtual production at large scale and even at a smaller scale that you could do at home.